first, I'm going to tell you a little, bit, a little bit about me, if you haven't seen any of my talks already. So I'm a software engineer at Bloomberg. I work in the new London office, and we have a booth outside for any questions. And I've also done C++ courses that you can find online, mostly related to modern C++. I had started my C++ career as a hobbyist game developer. I have a YouTube channel where I have some tutorials about game development in general, and also some small games. And generally what I do nowadays is participate in standardization, so I have a few papers, and also write blog posts about esoteric template metaprogramming on my blog. And I have a lot of open source projects, and also really like speaking at conferences, so you can find everything on YouTube. So I hope not to disappoint you, this talk is going to be a little bit more entry level, no crazy template stuff here, but I decided to change for, for, for once. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? This, this talk is slightly divided in a, like 50-50. The first 50% is going to be about high order functions in general. So what they are and how we can use them to make our code better. And then the other half is going to be about this proposal I have for the standard, which is called function ref, which is a new abstraction that works in conjunction with high order functions. As a disclaimer, this is not a talk that's on functional programming. I'm going to cover some techniques that are part of the paradigm, but I don't want you to feel like you need to embrace all the techniques of functional programming. This is just one of them, and I'm going to show you how you can use it practically in everyday uses. So even if your code base is mostly imperative, this has good uses for you. Also, we're going to take a look at how existing functional facilities work in the language to work with high order functions, and then how you can design and implement an ISO 0 plus 20 proposal. So we're going to take a look at that as well. I have a bunch of assumptions. You, are somewhat, you have to be somewhat familiar with Lambda expressions, templates, and model plus features, but please do not hesitate to ask any question during the talk. So let's begin with high order functions. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you know what a high order function is? OK, that's pretty good. Uh, by definition that I stole from Wikipedia, a high order function is a function that does at least one of the following. It either takes one or more functions as arguments or returns a function as its result. So remember, if I am a function that takes another function, that's considered one of them. Or if I'm a function that returns another function, I'm considered as well a high order function. A basic example you can see here is this function called call twice. It's implemented with a template, and we basically take a generic f callable object and then invoke it twice in the body. And if I invoke this function with a lambda, then it will print out hello twice. The idea here is that call twice is a high order function because it takes an f as an argument, which is a function itself. And in this case, the implementation technique we used is a template, but we have other ways we can implement them in the language. This is another example where we actually return a function instead of accepting one. Imagine we have this greater than function that takes a threshold, and the return type is going to be deduced from the body of the function. And what we can do here is simply return a lambda that captures the threshold by value, takes a generic integer x, and returns whether or not x is greater than the threshold. And you can imagine this being used in a context such as STL algorithms to produce a predicate in a terse manner. So you could say something like, I have my vector of numbers from 0, 4, 1, and so on. And then I want to count how many numbers are greater than 5. So what you can do is actually produce your predicate on the spot by using greater than 5. It's going to return the predicate, which is a lambda. And then the lambda is going to be used in count if in order to figure out how many elements match the predicate, which in this case is 2. So again, this returns a function object. So it's anything that you can call with round parentheses, which has to be invocable with an int. And the implementation technique we use here is just a closure, which is produced by a lambda expression and auto return type. But there are other ways you could do this in the language. So do we have any high order functions in the C++ standard? Anyone? Yeah? Any more what's, what's very common in C++ standard? Yes? Uh, yeah, what, what, kind of, what, what examples of high order functions do we find in C++ standard? Algorithms, yeah, that's pretty much the most common one. Any algorithm that takes a predicate or an action, that's a high order function. A little bit harder. Do we have any high order function in the C standard? Yeah, Q sort? Anything weirder? 
B search. It's a little bit weird, yeah, but there's actually a little bit more things in, in the C standard. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I missed some. So we have QSort and B search, which are the algorithms. Then we have some functions that take handlers for exiting the program and also for sig signals. So signal is quite interesting. Um, is a very uncommon example of higher order function, and I chose that for that reason. And if we see the CVP reference page for signal, we can see that it's pretty much all implementation defined how this thing, what, what the types of these things are. But the idea is that you call the signal function with a signal, and then you provide a handler, which is a closure or a function that's going to be invoked when the signal is raised by the OS. Yes? Yes, so the observation is that a high, a specialized case of the higher order function is what we call callbacks. Yes, every callback is a higher order function. So this signal is kind of weird. It tells you that basically handler has an implementation defined type and must be one of the following, either two macros that the C standard provides, but we don't really care about that, or a pointer to a function whose signature has to be equivalent to something that takes an int and returns nothing. So we can have that by using a lambda expression, and in theory, this is what you could do. You could say that whenever I get sig int, whenever the sig int is raised, then I'm gonna invoke this closure over here produced by the lambda expression, where I get my signal number as an argument and then print out something. So I believe this is completely undefined behavior because signal allows you to do only a few things inside the closure handler. But again, I wanted to make an uncommon example of a high order function. And in general, what I want to show you is also the lambda expressions work really well with high order functions. It's a very easy way to produce a closure. And that stateless closures, so that lambda expression which do not capture anything, are implicitly convertible to function pointers. So this is why we can use a lambda to invoke a C function like this. In the C++ standard, we have a bunch of things. Uh, someone mentioned algorithm, which is probably the biggest example of this. There's also numeric, because for some reason we split algorithms between two headers. And we do have set terminate, for example, that takes a handler for std terminate calls. Visit, apply, invoke, all of these are utilities that you can use with variant, tuple, or callables that actually take something to call on those, on those objects. And bind and bind front are examples of high order function that return something you can call as you can bind some arguments and get back a closure with bound arguments. A practical example of using uh, a lambda and an algorithm together in the standard is an idiom called erase remove. So this basically exists to allow you to clear out a bunch of elements from a vector that match a particular predicate. So imagine you have a list of entities, like the one over here, and these entities could be, you know, game entities, particles in a particle simulation, or, I don't know, employees in a managing application. And what you want to do is remove all the entities that are not active anymore from this vector. So this is our predicate over here for filtering. And one way of doing this efficiently, instead of shifting all the elements over and over, is to use the remove if algorithm, which given a range and a predicate, it will move all the elements you want to keep at the beginning of the range by doing a minimal amount of swaps. And then when you uh, call arrays on the vector, using the iterator return by remove if and the end iterator of entities is going to very quickly and nicely just um, slice the vector to only have the elements that do not match the predicate. So this is a very common idiom where you're trying to uh, remove a lot of things from contiguous storage in an efficient manner. Yep. Can, when does the vector do that? If you have a vector of pointers, it's a function. Okay. So that's one. The second one is it just calls it. And then the third one is it actually does something with it. Okay. So I see three different levels, but you call all of them higher order functions. But really, if you have something that's just as a big chain of function pointers, eh, then the one that you call back, it's really a callback. But the one that actually does something with it, that manipulates the function with the function, I think is what people think of when you say higher order functions. Okay, that's an interesting observation. So the point is that if we say that anything that returns a function is a higher order function, then even a vector of function pointers could be considered a higher order function when we call you know, square brackets operator, right? Is that what you're saying? Um, 
yeah, I, I guess that fits the definition. I, I, my, you know, reasonable assumption is that high order functions are interesting and we define them as high order function when they interact in a, such a way that you can compose them together and deal with the things that they accept or return in such a way that they make use of it. They operate on it functionally. They, yeah, they operate on it functionally. So I would get, I would say, yeah, I agree. If it's the definition, if you're being very strict, but if we use your, your common sense, I guess you can differentiate between what we define high order function or not. Okay, another example over here is variant and visit. So if you haven't seen variant, this is a C++ 17 class that's basically a tagged union. So if I have a type def event that's equivalent to variant of connect, disconnect, and heartbeat, this means that event can either be a connect, a disconnect, or a heartbeat. And these are simple types that you can define um, as structure classes. Now, one thing that you want to do on variants usually is given an event, you want to pattern match what's inside the variant and do something dependent, depending on what is the active alternative of the variant. And one way you can do that nicely is by using this overload utility that I show how to implement in my ACCU 2017 and CSS1 now talk. And basically you provide a lambda for each type inside the variant and that's gonna be your handler for each alternative. And then when you call visit with this overload and the variant, then it's gonna call exactly what you expect. So if I call process with an event that, connect, that contains connect, it's gonna print out process connect. If I call one with an event that contains disconnect, it's gonna print out process disconnect. So this is kind of a, a primitive way of doing pattern matching in C++. There are proposals to put this into the language, but this is another example of how you can combine functions together to achieve a useful result. So my use cases in general, if I had to find categories for them, I would probably say that avoiding repetition of code is one of the main uses of high order functions. Then inversion of control flow is another one, asynchronicity, and also compile time metaprogramming. And we're gonna see examples of all of these things. So avoiding repetition, why is this important? I believe that code repetition, even if minimal, leads to bugs and maintenance overhead. Like as soon as you have two pieces of code that need to be kept in sync, that's already overhead for maintenance and people need to remember to update both in, at the same time. So I tend maybe to overdo it, but I like to remove every repetition in my code bases. My coworkers are not too happy about that. Yes. This is super important because what you said is when they must be kept in sync. Yes. There are times when two things do the same thing, but they don't need to be kept in sync. So you can take this set up, you did the precise behavior doesn't need to be the same. And for levelization purposes, sometimes a tiny little bit of code replicated saves the cycle. So in those very rare cases which I found it, um, if sometimes a little bit of code duplicated is better than trying to save that last line and then for the yeah, absolutely. So the comment is that when they must be kept in sync, it's very important to avoid repetition to avoid mistakes. But sometimes repeti repetition can be useful, for example, when you have a physical hierarchy and you want to avoid cycles and you want to levelize the hierarchy very nicely, it might be worthwhile to have a little piece of or, 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 you know, repeated code. So this is an example from some integration tests that we had in production. And the idea is that we wanted to test our routing behavior and what we did was create some machines, and for each machine we wanted to reserve a port that was unique on localhost. So we wanted to make sure that every machine had a unique port, and this context thing allows us to get one in a thread safe manner so that we can run multiple integration tests at the same time in parallel. And this is a very simple example of how you can avoid trivial repetition. In this case, it's not a big deal, but instead of calling reserve port every single time with an argument, you can simply create a local function over here by providing a lambda. You can capture everything by reference because you know that safely nothing will escape the scope of test routing. And then you can simply call get port multiple times to always get a unique port without having to repeat it. The main benefit I see of this is that the code is slightly more future proof. If you want to change local loss to something else, you only have to do it once and you have no risk of forgetting to change it in a place where um, you, know, you, you should have changed it. Other times it can be more complicated, so I didn't find any uh, example from production that fit on a slide, but this is something that I did before. I was creating a simple UI system for a game, and I had this weird constraint that basically I wanted to go over all the widgets, 
and the widgets are basically a hierarchy of sub-widgets that can be recursive, and I had to do three actions on all visible widgets in order. So first I wanted to recalculate the focus for every widget that was visible, then recalculate the bounds after I recalculate the focus because that can affect the bounds, and then after I have the bound that is calculated, I wanted to call update. So my code looked a little bit like this. Basically, I iterate over the children of the current widget. If the child is visible, I'm gonna recalculate the focus, and then I'm gonna do that with the three operations. So as you can see, there is a structure that's repeated, and what way can we do, how can we uh, avoid repetition here in a terse manner? So again, I think that a high order function is probably the best option here. You can have a simple uh, local lambda inside your update function, this, we, we can give it a meaningful name, such as four visible children, which is very self-explanatory, and then we can take an F action to perform on all the visible children. So in this case, our real code becomes three invocations of this lambda, where we just provide the action that we want to be performed. So for all visible children, we will recalculate the focus, then the bounds, and then update. You can imagine uh, making this even prettier by um, accepting multiple actions in the same invocation call, but that there is a trade-off between the complexity of how you avoid repetition and the benefit you get from it. So I think that this is a reasonable trade-off. Another use case that's very important is the inversion of control flow. And this basically is when you have a function that defines the control flow and then you want to decide what the action or predicate is. Um, and the idea is separating what happens from how it happens. And I think that the prime example of this is the 17 parallel algorithms, because they just tell you what they're going to do, but they are free to do it however they want. As an example, imagine you have some sort of physics simulation maybe, and you have this component over here that has a bunch of mathematical 2D vectors for positions, velocity, and acceleration. And then you have a vector of this physics component, so you can imagine maybe they're particles or shapes, and then you can use a CS17 algorithm such as D for each that takes a new argument before the range, which is your execution policy, and this allows you to specify how you want this algorithm to be executed. And you have various things you can specify. Sequential will do it only on one thread, but then you have something like par and seek that stands for parallel and sequential, which allows the compiler to run it on mul multiple threads and use vectorization. And vendors are also able to specify their own, their own uh, execution policies, so you can imagine something running on the GPU as well. And after you specify the execution policy, you give it a range and then a, a function to execute on those elements. And now it's completely up to the compiler to decide how this will be executed. So if you have you know, 50 components, it's very likely that the compiler will decide to run this sequentially because the overhead of spawning the tasks is greater than you know, just doing the work. But if you have 50 million, then it's very likely that it's gonna do a little bit of dispatching over your course. So this is very cool, and it's an example how it completely separates the control flow from the action. Another benefit of this is that if you use this kind of technique across your code base, then you can reuse and test the control flow from the action separately. So instead of having everything bound together, you can test the control flow with some simple actions, or you can test more complicated actions on their own. So this is very good for unit testing. Another example is printing a comma-separated list of elements. This comes up a lot, um, especially in, in C++ chats. People are asking what's the best way of doing this. Uh, there is nothing in the standard that does it in a single line, but we can figure out an abstraction. So the idea here is that we have a vector of t's, so a bunch of elements, and we want to print out all the elements in the vector by putting a comma in between. And you could do this maybe to serialize something to JSON or just have some pretty printing. And I would say that this is a decent initial version. We just take a vector by const reference, then we check if the vector is empty, and if it is, we just return. If it's not, we're gonna print out the first element, and then we're gonna start looping from the second element to the end of the vector, and what we're going to do is print our separator and then the element that uh, we care about. So this is gonna ensure that empty vectors uh, don't print anything and that we don't have a trailing comma. So the, the thing I like to do when I want to transform a specialized abstraction in a more generic one is to identify the structure. So in this case, we see that we have our empty check, then our action, then we have this loop that goes from the second element to the last one, then we have our separation, and then our action again. 
So now that we identify the structure, we know that we can parameterize our abstraction on the action and the separation, so they can be more generic. And once we do that, we simply can create a four separated abstraction, which you can think of some kind of SED algorithm equivalent, and we basically extracted that action and separation to two parameters that the user can provide in the form of functions. So in this case, instead of printing, we call this f over here that's user provided, and instead of separating with a comma, we call this f sep that's user provided as well. So now our separation can be anything, it can be any character, or it can be something more complicated, like something that changes over time, and our action doesn't have to be printing. Again, it can be something complicated. Yep. I have to pick on you. Sure. Uh, what do you mean? Like for in the, in the name? Yeah, for the name, you chose four, but that's sort of like the implementation, isn't it? Yes, uh, okay, that's that's interesting observation. Why did you call it four separated? Because four is just an implementation detail. I didn't use four in the name because I used four in the body. I my, Mentally, my idea was for each element in this range, separated by something. So it's, I see. but you can find a better name. You know, naming is the hard part. Oh, yeah. So. Merge. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, there is a merge. But, yeah, could work. Join, yes. Yeah, my name means sucks. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can do is then redefine print in terms of four separated. So our print function will simply be a call to four separated that takes the vector. Um, our action would be print out the thing to a CDC out, and our separation action would be print out a comma. Now, you might be arguing, like, this is more complicated, why would you do this? And absolutely, if you're just printing something one time or two times in your code base, then don't do this. But the benefit is if you find yourself using the structure multiple times, or if you want to thoroughly test the structure independently from the actions, then I would strongly advise you to do something like this. In this case, for separator is reusable, it provides the control flow, and the user provides the actions. So if you want to be fancy, maybe you're writing some console application that wants to print things in a pretty way, then you can have something like white print, and white print might be just a call to for separated that uses a space instead of a comma, and now you can have this widely printed letters with more spacing in between. So it might be a way in your console output to differentiate between different kinds of things. Or maybe if you are creating some sort of game and you want to have this corrupted print thing to uh, write weird code for the, for the user, then you can, you can change your separator to a random character. This shows how this action can have state, and it will print out a corrupted version of Hello World like this. This is another example from production. We were basically working on this uh, broker application for our distributed system, and we had this concept of a trading system, and we wanted to basically go through all the systems in an order set, and if they match a particular predicate, we wanted to execute an action on them and also remove them from the set. So the idea was you have a set of all your systems which are uninitialized, then you go through them, you find the initialized one, you change their states, and move them from the original set to another one to keep track of them efficiently. So the way we did this was by creating this consume if abstraction that we found other use cases throughout the code base for. The idea is that it takes a range, a predicate, and a function, and then for each element inside the range that matches the predicate, then the function is going to be executed, and the element is going to be removed from the range. So this is why it's called consume if, because whatever matches is going to be removed from the original range. And the implementation is quite straightforward. We simply iterate over the range. This can be a map, a set, or whatever. Then we check if the predicate is valid for a particular element. And if it is, we invoke our action and also remove it from the range. And in the case of a set or a map, dot arrays will return an iterator to the next valid position. So we need to update our iterator over here. Otherwise, we simply go forward and do nothing. And the way we use this for the use case I mentioned is we go through the system and order set for each system that's initialized, then we change the state to re ready to sync, and this also moves the system to another set where we have all the systems ready to sync. Yes? What 
Okay, so the question is, what happens if you want to extend this algorithm to collections that do not invalidate the reader's where they, they're being erased? Um, so you have multiple techniques, techniques there. Um, maybe you can figure out a way of writing a single implementation that works with everything, but I'm not sure how you would do that. However, now we have if constexper, we have, you know, Sphina, we have overloading. You can do a bunch of things to figure out what the container does and then specialize your algorithm with that container. And I'm fairly confident you can make it work for vectors, maps, sets, lists with the same interface, but different implementations that are under the hood. So one thing you could do, for example, is detect whether or not arrays returns an iterator, and if it does, you assign it, otherwise you just go forward. So it might be as, as simple as just wrapping this condition over here in an if const expert checking what arrays returns. But there might be more considerations take place. But that's a good question. Usually when you want to, it, it, it's, it's, it's like a slippery slope. Like, you know, you find this abstraction, then you say, okay, this is really good. We can use it in three places in the code base. Then you start thinking, okay, maybe we can make it more general and use it everywhere. And again, I really like that way of thinking, but sometimes it's too much, so you need to be a little bit careful with that. Another use case that's very important for uh, high order functions, and mostly lambda in general, is asynchronicity. And I would say, unfortunately, this is currently the easiest way to express asynchronous callbacks. Like if you have a function that um, you know, makes a call, HTTP call request, and then you want to call something on um, success, then you need to provide a callback in some form. And the easiest way to do this is by using a CD future thread and providing lambdas as callbacks. But many use cases might be superseded by coroutines, so when we have a language feature that does this better, maybe we don't need to have all these layers of nesting with lambdas and, cor and, um, and closures. So an example here from another talk I did in 2018 about ACCU with Salesforce plus now, is how can you write composition of futures with no allocation and no type erasure? That's an interesting detail, but what I'm interested about for this slide is the idea that we produce a graph of computation by concatenating together uh, actions put in lambdas. So we can say for all these actions, so get requests to this URL and get requests to this URL, then when all of them are completed, execute this action over here. And you can see that the then expects something with a payload that contains two data objects because we have two um, nodes at the beginning of our graph. So the idea here is that we make this HTTP request to the both websites. When, when we get both the payloads at the same time, we apply a stitch function on them and basically provide, create our college of a cat and a dog. And again, I cannot think of any easier way of expressing this in such a way that's asynchronous and allows you to compose it as easily as possible, but coroutines might be the answer to that. And finally, the last use case for our function is metaprogramming fun, if you are that kind of person. And basically, it's really hard to define algorithms that work on a heterogeneous sequence of types like tuples or a bunch of compile time integers because there is currently no language construct that allows you to generate code. So what you can do is abuse higher order functions to provide those constructs. As an example, I created this enumerate types function, enumerate as in Python here, where you basically iterate over a type and an index at the same time. And if you want to do this enumeration at compile time for multiple reasons, uh, what you can do is simply allow enumerate types to get any number of types with a variadic template, so int, float, and char. And then we can use here a fancy plus 20 feature, which is a template Synth, uh, a lambda with traditional template syntax. So we provide a type name t and auto i as template arguments to our lambdas. And then inside the body of the lambda, we can print out the index of the type and its name. And the output is 0i, 1f, and 2c. But it might be compiler dependent on what type, type id does. The point is that everything that's being done here is basically code generation. So it doesn't have any runtime overhead for the iteration. It just produces the code for all the types. Enumerate is an operation you might want sometimes. Other times you might just want to iterate over the types without an index or sometimes do even weirder stuff. And it, it's hard to find use cases unless you're writing a generic library, but as an example, something that comes up often in production is when you have some sort of abstraction, like a container or some sort of utilities, and you want to test it with multiple types. And an easy way of, do the, of doing that is simply having a four types loop, iterate over the types, and then put your test inside the loop. I, I keep calling it loop, but it's just code generation. And if you don't have anything like GTest or a framework that does that for you, this would be a nice way of doing that. 
Okay, now I think we can get to, uh, yeah. I just feel I have to say this, I'm sorry. No. Um, when you're writing this extremely complex code, you're writing the inside production code, you want the production code to be as fast and as glorious and as simple as possible. When you're writing a test driver, you want it to be as stupid and straightforward and repetitive and redundant and opportunistic for mistakes as possible. And when the two coincide, you have a working code. Okay. The observation is, when you want to write a test driver, you want to be as stupid, as redundant as possible. When you want to write a production code, you want to be you know, as refined as possible, if we say that. And put the two together. And putting the two together makes a working program. Yes. I think I agree with that. I, I would say I hate redundancy even in test drivers. When you have an abstraction that can work with multiple types, I don't want to copy paste it, I just want it to be. Okay, I think I agree with you in principle. I think we just disagree on the way we will write a test driver, but I think you that's. Find what I said and you said, but we do agree. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> For some definition of agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, high order functions versus other abstractions. So, this is something I haven't seen explored in any other talk before, and I wanted to go down this route. I think it's interesting. Because sometimes you can use other techniques, other abstractions to achieve the same goals. So there are things that you can implement both with IOrder function and array I guards, for example, or iterators. So I want to compare what's easier to do and what are the differences. An example over here is a thread safe access wrapper to an object. So something that comes often in production, which is probably not a great thing to say, is when you have some sort of object and you want to access it from a thread, in a thread safe manner, so you just stick a mutex with the object and you need to take the lock to the mutex before accessing the object. Obviously, if you just provide the mutex on its own and the object on its own, then you can forget to lock the mutex when you're accessing the object, but if you package them into some sort of synchronized abstraction like this one, then you are always forced to lock the mutex because there's no way you can access the object unless you're going through the abstraction. So as an example here, we have this class foo, and we want to uh, allow only thread-safe access to this foo instance. So we wrapped into a synchronized object, and then this S foo will contain a foo instance plus a mutex, and some way that the user can uh, access the, the underlying foo only after having it locked in a thread safe way. So now our choice is what interface should we expose? We could, we could have, for example, expose array, array I guard. So you could say something like S foo dot access. It gives you back some guard that locks the mutex for its lifetime, and then you can access the foo from the guard. Or we could use a high order function, so you could say something like sfoo.access, you provide an action, and that action is executed after taking the lock for you from the, from the thing. So this is what they would look like. The first one is over here, you have the synchronized instance, then in some scope, you get this guard f by calling dot access, and then when the guard is constructed, it will lock the mutex for you, and when it's destroyed, it will unlock it. And then you can only access the full instance through f, so for example, we could overload the arrow operator to access the members of the full instance, or simply the star operator or a get function, whatever. So this works. It is very friendly to control flow, so if you have this inside of a loop or inside of a function, then calling return, continue or break will do the right thing. And in general, I couldn't find any major drawback with this. Now, for the higher order function example, you can do the same by calling, for, for example, something like dot .access and then providing an action that's going to be executed on the full instance. So as you can see, this function over here takes the underlying full instance. And in this case, the guarantee is that if you call dot .access, this action will only be executed after taking the mutex. So the synchronized wrapper is taking care of that for you. Now, there is a very, very big advantage to this technique, which is very easy to implement. Like, it's literally one line. However, as soon as you do something complicated in the action, like, for example, access the underlying environment, you will need to capture things into the lambda. Or as soon as you do something like use this inside of a loop or another function, then if you use return, return is going to return from the lambda, not the outer scope. 
And if you try to use continuum break, that's not going to work either because it's an untied another scope. So this is why I say that it's unfriendly to control flow. It doesn't play nicely when you are in multiple nested levels. Yes? And yes, that's another, I think that's right. The observation is the second implementation doesn't compose as well. And in general, if you have guards, I think it's easier to have multiple layers and stuff like that. Here you are forced to have nesting every time you enter stuff. Okay, so how would we implement the RAI version? So something you could do is, for example, write this access function. It returns an implementation detail guard type that you could define even inside the function itself, some access guard. The guard would hold a lock guard and would provide operators and constructors to do all the things you have to do with the underlying T object. And then the construction would lock the mutex and the structure would unlock it. And then what we simply do is return an instance of access guard pointing to the synchronized instance that we have so that it can work in conjunction. So it's not exactly hard to implement, but it is all boilerplate. Like you need this extra type, you need to make sure that you delete the move and copy constructors, you need to make sure that you have these operators to access the underlying object. So there's something involved in the implementation of this thing. In contrast, if you see the high order function is literally, it's trivial to implement. What you do is simply you lock the guard over here, you have the lock guard over here that locks the mutex, and then you simply invoke your high order function on the objects, and that's it. So it's literally one, one extra line compared to a normal invocation of the object. And if you're feeling fancy and hate your coworkers, you can also use the comma operator to avoid giving the lock guard a name. So you can put everything on a single return statement. It works. And in general, I would say it is way simpler to implement and review if you don't use the comma operator. The trade-off here is, do you want to have a very quick implementation or something that's more composable, more reusable? And I think that in general, that depends on your use case. If you're writing this as a generic library component, then it is probably better to write the more complicated version, but that has more advantages. If you need this quickly as a one-off, then it might be better to start with the higher implementation and then consider changing it in the future. Another example of the same uh, exact choice is benchmarking a function. Imagine you want to write a very simple benchmark utility that given a function, it will, it will basically return the time that's required to invoke that function. So you go write something like this, you take an F, you take the current timestamp, you invoke F, and then you return the now timestamp minus the previous one. So this will give you the running time of a function. And again, you could use this with a high order function or with a guard. You can do it both ways, and it depends on your use case. Another comparison I want to make is with iterators. And, and as an example, I chose iterating over a filtered range. So imagine you have a bunch of integers, and you want to filter out all the even ones, and then iterate only on those ones. Then you can write a filtered abstraction in two ways. One way you could do this is by using iterators. So you have this filtered thing that takes a range and a predicate, and it will return some sort of view, some sort of range that provides a begin and end uh, member functions. And once you have begin and end, you can use it with a range-based for loop. You can use it with SED algorithms. And you know it's very flexible, it's very nice, and it's very friendly to control flow. And we are seeing something like this in the standard library with the inclusion of ranges by mostly Eric Nibbler. And yeah, this works quite well, but the problem is that implementation is complicated. We're going to see an example of that later. For, if we want to make a four filter function to iterate over the filter one with a high order function, then the syntax looks different. You have to use a lambda or a closure over here. It does a very, very simple implementation as before, but again, we might need to capture things that are in the outer scope or it might be unfriendly to control flow depending on our use case. And again, I would also say it's uh, not as composable as the other one because you will need to write your own system to compose functions instead of simply being able to use SED algorithms, for example. So if you want to write a filter iterator, you have to write all of this stuff. And I mean, it's not a huge deal, but it takes time. It's something you have to maintain and document. So there's a bunch of things involved here, like all the iterator type devs, making sure you have the right, right constructors, making sure you expose the right um, um, you know, functionality so that I can work with any iterator type. Uh, it's not trivial. It takes time, and it's just not trivial. Yes? Isn't this an application of this, the IO streams package where you Application of what? Application of what? Uh, 
classification of, of the higher order functions where you're passing. It's not, you're not really passing in a function, but they call the manipulators in the stream. They represent functions. Things like setting the width of the thing, the length of the thing. I, um, he, for some, I think he fits the definition like if you squint, because, you know, Stream operator is a function call, and then you pass in this manipulator to the stream operator, and the manipulator itself is kind of a callable thing. Well, like Adele, but for example, Adele is in data, it's doing something, right? Yeah. So is it not an example of a higher order function? <sighs> Maybe. I, so the, the observation is, are IO manipulators in IO streams an example of higher order functions? The stream operator is a higher order function, the manipulator is a function. Yes, I'm not comfortable in saying yes, but they do fit the bill if you think about all the properties. If you see streaming as a function call, you see the manipulator as a function call. But, but isn't it a function call? Just an yeah, yeah, it is a function call. I would say yes, it's not a very useful categorization to say it's a higher order function, I would put it that way. Even if it is, it's not useful to. It's common. It's like you just think of it as. Yes, exactly. But it's not useful to uh, see it uh, as higher order function. It doesn't give you any benefit to look at it from that functional perspective, I would say that. And I was going to say the same thing about a callback. Callback to me seems like it's so precise that even though it might be a higher order function, it's not really the full on higher Like these things are higher order functions. They yes. Really okay. So, so the observation is that a callback, even though it is higher order function, is not as useful to think it is. In those terms, it's easier to just say it's a callback and everyone knows what it is. Uh, yes, so I was also saying that if you use the high order function implementation of filtering, then it's very easy to write. You just loop over the range, check the predicate, and then invoke your action. So again, the trade off here that I see is complexity of implementation against flexibility and composition. So it's a choice you might want to make. So as a recap for high order function, they are very powerful, they have many different use cases, and I think they are easier to write than existing alternatives. Uh, if I have to give you some guidelines, I would probably say when you need a quick, re testable, or reusable abstraction that doesn't have to be very composable, they are great. However, if you have, you know, you're writing a library, you're writing some sort of framework for the users of your company or whatever, then you might not want to do this. You might want to take the hit and write a more complicated abstraction that's more flexible. Uh, in general, we might see language alternatives uh, supersede some of these abstractions. As an example, coroutines might be a better way of doing asynchronicity compared to callbacks, or ranges, which are you know, more like a library feature, not a language feature, might be a good way of avoiding the creation of utilities like for filtered, if we have everything in the library. They do not play nicely with control flow on the caller side. If you try to use return, break, continue on a lambda body, it's not gonna be trivial. And if you want to return from the outer function, from a lambda, you cannot do that easily. You can hack these things in. For example, you could use special return values that uh, propagate the intention of returning, continuing, and break. But then the implementation becomes complicated, and you lose the benefit of having a simple implementation. They are even more powerful in 17 and 20. In 17, we got context per lambdas. In 20, we got templated lambdas, so you can do more things with them in a terse syntax. And there are some proposals that might have helped make them even better. For example, this one is the terse lambda proposal by Barry Resvin and someone else. I'm sorry for forgetting their name. But basically, it, may, it had a nice syntax to make uh, small lambdas more readable, but it got rejected. OK, so let's get into the second half. Any more questions on? I order functions in general. Okay, so let's take a look at function ref. And you've seen pretty much all the higher order functions I implemented in the previous half were templates, but what other options do we have? Like how can we implement these ideas in C++? So probably the basic one that's also valid in C is using pointers to function. So if I have some operation and I want to basically Imagine this is a calculator, right? And we want to provide the operation we want to do, maybe addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and we want to abstract this idea over uh, <laughs> this f parameter, and then invoke it with two numbers. So in this case, if I want a simple operation, then I can simply use a function pointer f that takes two integers and returns an int, and this would work, but it has a bunch of drawbacks. First of all, it only works for non-member function and stateless closures. So as soon as you have a member function or a closure that captures something, then you cannot use a pointer to a function anymore. It doesn't work with stateful callable objects. So if you have something that, for example, has state and is also callable, like a functor 
or something with an overload operator call, then it doesn't work anymore. However, it does small runtime overhead is very, very easily in line in the same translation unit, so the compiler can simply see through it and in line. And it's also constrained with an obvious signature. So we've seen that in the templates, you, have, you take this f thing, and you don't know what f takes or returns. But here, it is obvious that it takes two integers and returns an int. I have to ask, what do you mean by stateless? Uh, stateless, yes. It, I mean, when you use, for example, a lambda, and it doesn't capture anything, then there is a special thing that allows you to convert it to a function pointer. Okay, so can I I want to contrast it with something else. What if I have a static function that keeps a use count? So static, static member or global static. You pass in the function every time you call the operation. It does exactly what you want it to do, but it keeps a count. Okay. And then after you access it. Yeah. So what is the difference between a captureless lambda and a static function that contains a counter? Well, the counter is, you need to think of it in terms of objects, right? The state of the static function is not part of, the, of an object. It's somewhere in memory at a fixed location. And then the function itself is just a pointer to a function. However, for the lambda case, if you capture something in the lambda, that thing is part of the payload of the object. So it's like a data member of the closure. So that's the difference. Okay. And if you have function pointer, you can refer to the static function, obviously, but not to the lambda because the lambda is an actual object. It's not a function. So that's the... Could you relate that then to having stateful functors for predicates for, for containers, for example, which you can do, but they're a bad idea? Well, they're often a bad idea, I agree with that. You can do, but they're exactly the same as a lambda with a capture. They're just, you know, an object which contains some associated state as a data member, and then an overloaded operator call. So they wouldn't work with uh, pointer to function as well, because they're not functions, they're objects. Okay. Make sense? Then we've seen template parameters. This is slightly more flexible. It works with any function object or callable if you use a CD invoke. And in general, we say that this is a zero cost abstraction because it's as close as you can get to having full information for the compiler to inline and remove the overhead of calling a function. And this is true. Like in the same translation unit, everything will be, just up, will be inlined if um, they are small enough. However, this is hard to constrain, and what, by that what I, what I mean is, if you see this signature, auto operation f ref ref f, what, what is this f? Like you don't know what f takes, you don't know what it returns. You have ways of doing that with enable if, for example, and is invocable to provide a constraint, but that's not nice, like it's hard to read. And you also have to do weird stuff like this decal type, return return type to make sure that it works with fine and it works with uh, any return type. So it is hard to implement, hard to constrain. However, in C++ 20, this is less true because we have concepts, so you might just be able to say invocable int, open parentheses int int, and it will be nicer to read. One major issue is that this has to be implemented in a header, and that means that it might degrade compilation time, it will not be able to be virtual, and it will create a physical dependency for every user. So that's a possible drawback. Now we get to a CD function, um, and as you can see, we are like almost at the end of the talk and I didn't talk about it. I don't really like a CD function that much, mostly for the naming. Like this is not a way you can just refer to a function. This is an actual polymorphic wrapper that owns functions. It can dynamically allocate, it can be big and has a significant overhead. And while this works with any function object or callable, you're gonna see that at a runtime, it will have more overhead than the other alternatives because it's hard for the compiler to inline and optimize it. This is due to the fact that, first of all, the implementation is complicated. It will have a small buffer optimization most of the cases, and then you know it can allocate, it has type erasure, so it's really hard for the compiler to figure out how to inline this object. It might be different in the future, but right now, no compiler does this properly. And also, it has issues with movable, move-only lambdas. For example, it doesn't work with them. It requires the caller, callables to be copyable. It's, it's, it's very useful, but it's um, widely overused. Let's put it that way. Question. Yes. Can we, we fix function in 20 so that it actually does use allocators properly? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Are you asking if there is a PMR function? Uh, no, I, well, no, because I, I know that I've been working with Pablo Hoffman and we have a fix at Bloomberg, uh, but I don't know if it's made it to this day. I don't think it's in 20, but I'm, I'm not 100% confident. Um, yes, what was I saying? Like the, the major benefit is really easy to use. Like it is constrained as a very obvious signature. You cannot get dangling references or anything like that. 
And you know, it just works, but it has a significant cost. There's also another thing that I don't like, which is it, it has unclear semantics. Now, this is kind of a stretch, but depending on how you in, initialize it, it can be both owning or non owning. If you initialize it with a, any callable, then it's going to take a copy of the callable and own it. But if you use something like a reference wrapper, then it's going to behave as if it's a reference to another function. So this is up to you to how you use it, but from the signature, you don't really know whether or not it wants to be a reference or an owning wrapper. Most of the time it's owning, but there is this dichotomy. Now let's get to function ref. So this is what I propose for the standard, and it's uh, an abstraction that's very lightweight. Like std function, it works with any function object or callable, and like function pointers, it is very, very easy to inline, and has very small overhead. So any compiler that I've uh, used completely lines function ref in the same TU. We're gonna see benchmarks in a bit. It is constrained as a very obvious signature like a CD function, and it has clear non-owning semantics. So when you see function ref, that ref naming tells you exactly that this is gonna be a reference to a function, and it's not gonna own anything. Which also means you need to be careful because it's easy to get dangling references. And it's very lightweight, so you can think of it as a string view for callable objects. So let's explore this a little bit further. In a nutshell, if you have a function ref of R and args, then you have a non-owning reference to a callable that will be taking args and return an R. And the parallel, as I mentioned, is std string is to a string view what std function is to function ref. So string is the owning expensive type, string view is the lightweight view over the string. Function is the owning expensive type, function ref is the lightweight view over the function. It doesn't own or extend the lifetime of the reference callable, so you need to be careful with managing lifetimes properly, but it is very lightweight, it's friendly to no accept and optimization. So most of the interfaces don't accept and it's very easy for the compiler to optimize it. I proposed it in this paper, it is currently in LWG. At the last meeting I got some feedback, I need to fix some things, but it might still make it into 20, I'm not as sure anymore, but it depends on how it goes to the next meeting, it might make it into 20 or uh, uh, maximum 23. Many thanks to these people that helped a lot. I'm not gonna go through all the names, but they contributed heavily to the paper. So why would you use function ref instead of a CD function? So there are two reasons for this. The first one and the most important one is performance. So if you don't want to pay the overhead cost of going through the indirection, going through the allocation, the ownership of this std function object, then function ref is gonna be likely much faster for use case. And still will allow you to not use templates, to avoid compile time coupling, and to have clear uh, constrained interfaces. The other one is when you want clear reference semantics. So you want to give your user an interface that says, give me a reference to a function, and you don't want to leave it up to the caller to decide whether or not the thing is gonna be owned or referenced. So why use function ref instead of template parameters? As I mentioned, it's way easier to write, read, and teach. If you need to teach someone new to C++ how to write an enable if constraint for a function, they are not gonna use C++ anymore. So yeah. It's usable in polymorphic hierarchies. This is important. We had use cases where we wanted the performance of uh, function ref, but also have a polymorphic way of customizing the behavior. And what hit the spot between performance and uh, flexibility was function ref. And also it has better compilation times. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't have compile time coupling, it doesn't have crazy machinery inside like a city function, and in general it just compiles faster because it's simpler. So this is the entire interface of this thing. As you can see, it's basically just a pointer to a function object, which is type erased as a void star, and then a function pointer, which is going to be used to figure out how to invoke the object. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna show how it's implemented in a bit. Then it's all as much as no accept and constructor friendly as possible. And you can copy it, you can initialize it from any callable, you can uh, rebind it to another callable, you can swap it and call it, and that's pretty much it. So it's very simple, very lightweight. Let's start with some examples where we use this in production. So this one is kind of interesting, I think. We had, again, for the same project with the broker for trading systems, we had this use case where we had a bunch of queues and each queue had a bunch of commands and we wanted to replay them for testing purposes or for debugging purposes. And these commands, however, were stateful and we didn't want to pay the memory overhead of storing them multiple times. So what we did, we created this ref counted abstraction for a command, which is kind of like a share pointer but single threaded because we didn't need the atomics here. 
and then we had a queue that given a command ID, give, sorry, we had a map that given a command ID gave us back the actual ref counted object. And then we have a bunch of queues. You can imagine maybe every, every user used different commands in different orders. So we wanted to uh, link a particular user with a set of commands. So we add a queue ID to a deck of command IDs. And what we wanted to do is provide an interface that allows us to replay one of these queues without exposing implementation details. Because ref counted is one thing we might want to do today, but maybe if we figure out it's too expensive, we want to get rid of it. We might want to not use decks or maps, so we want to have a single interface that's uh, future proof. So what we did is have this iterate function, it takes a QID and a function ref f that takes a command and does nothing. And what this basically means is that for a given QID, I will execute f on every command inside that queue. So what we did, we found the queue and we got the deck and then we went through the deck in reverse because we wanted to replay these commands and then we invoked our function ref with the item. So this particular interface is, is not asynchronous, it's supposed to be a synchronous way to iterate over the thing and in general, it's easier to implement than iterators. We could have done this one iterator, but it was a very specialized use case. So this is the way we decided to go. Uh, yes? So the QK is the same ID. The Q what, sorry? Ah, uh, yes, I'm sorry, that's a typo. Yeah, that should be find ID, yeah. Yes, it does work with stateful lambdas, yes. The, the important thing is that you have to guarantee that the lambda will leave more than the function ref, because it doesn't extend its lifetime. It's becoming more and more clear that we have many patterns to make use of higher order functions, and the patterns are more familiar than higher order functions. It seems like higher order functions is a higher order description of what we're talking about here. Yes. Because when we have a pattern, like visitor, we say visitor. We don't say, oh, I've got a higher order function. Oh, great. <laughs> That's a fair, fair observation which is we have a lot of patterns, we should talk in terms of patterns, not higher order functions, they're just like, um, you're saying that this is an umbrella term that covers all the patterns. It's so would you, would you call this a visitor? Term, it's not useless, of course. Yes. Right, there's a purpose, but when you have visitor, when you have something that's going to apply something to each thing, there, the applicator pattern or the visitor pattern or the so-and-so pattern, if it's common, commonly known by simple people, when you said higher order function, I was like, I can't wait to see this talk, I have no idea what he's talking about. I really, seriously, it's awesome. But, but you see what I'm saying, that for vocabulary, there are many patterns that, that use higher order functions. Okay, that makes sense. Would you call this a visitor? I would because I think, well, visitor is a very specific thing, but there's applicator, and then there's just the concept of reversing a for loop by inverting it, by passing in what you need, and you've already categorized it completely from first principles. So you've reinvented something that's been around forever. I've not reinvented it, I'm not claiming that, I'm just saying, yeah. Have. It's okay, it's fine. What I'm saying is that what you've done is you've explained all the properties of this thing. It's not like map. You, you learned map by just learning it, right? It's there. You didn't invent it. It's always been there. Okay. I, I'm on board with that. I think that, yes, it's a more wide description of things that can be specialized into patterns and maybe have more common names. For example, I'm not super familiar with design patterns. So for me, it's easier to think in terms of higher order function, but maybe for you that you have, you know, this experience with design patterns, it's easier for you to think in terms of visitor and stuff. I didn't have that face. I'm too young for that. <laughs> Was there a question in the back? Yes. Yes, yes. So that's one of the drawbacks with function. You cannot use it if you have a move-only closure or move-only lambda, you cannot use a CD function. Now again, you could write something that's like function but supports that, like unique function. I think there was a proposal for that. Um, that would be better, but still the, there will still be overhead due to the ownership of the callable. So they cover different use cases, that's, I think, yeah. Yeah. Can you easily convert from one to another? 
So the question is, what's the interact? What are the interactions between a city function and function ref? Uh, in general, function ref works with anything that's callable. So function is callable, and you can take a function ref to an STD function. That's totally fine. And maybe that would be a more efficient way if they knew about each other's internals. But that's up to the standard library implementation. I think they can do it. They're free to do that. But in general, anything that you can call, including STD function or a third-party version of function, you can use function ref with it. You always have to guarantee that the lifetimes match, but it's totally fine. Other use case with virtual design. Again, same project. We had some sort of packet cache here. I can't remember the details, honestly, why this was here. But we wanted to provide this cache for packets and also provide a way of replaying and consuming those things. So replaying implies that we don't touch the packets. So we can have this callback thing that is, uh, takes a const packet ref. But consuming means that we want to get rid of them so we can have an R by reference. And this might be more efficient if we want to transfer the packets from one cache to another. So we have these two interfaces, replay and consume. And they are virtual, and they take functional refs. And the reason we did this is because we had multiple strategies to uh, cache the packets, and we want to figure out which one was better for particular use cases. So one implementation might be a simple contiguous packet cache. It uses just a vector of packets or a DEC to store the packets. And then the replay one will be an overridden, overridden function over the base one that simply iterates over them and calls the CB uh, function. And the consume one would do the same thing, but it would move them into the callback so that the user can move them somewhere else or get rid of them. And in this case, after consume, we just clear. So we had two different semantics. We could have, you know, we, you could use an iterator or something like that to make this work, but then it's hard to implement it with a virtual interface. You may need to make sure that your iterator works with any particular interface you want or have a type array iterator. So this for us was the best trade-off between uh, flexibility of polymorphism and ease of implementation. And it's a simple way you can use function ref for this. Last one, I think we have this example over here of a node monitor. And nodes for us were simply machines. And what we wanted to do is basically sweep over all the nodes we had with a given timestamp and then perform an action. So as an example over here, we have a state change callback that given a node that satisfies our predicate will change the state of the node. And then we have a timestamp that's our threshold. So you can imagine we could sweep over all the nodes with a with the now timestamp, see if they have timed out, and then switch their state from up to down to control what machines are up or down. And what we do is we iterate over the nodes, which are in, in this data map. We make sure that the node is not down, and then we check the heartbeat of the node compared to the timestamp we provided. And then if it matches a threshold, for example, 10 seconds, then we call this state change function that changes it to down, for example. And as you can see, there's another use case for function ref, because a state change callback is just a function that takes a node ID and a state transition. And yeah. If you, if you are, remember what we did before, we've seen this structure before, it's just consume if. So what ended up happening after we implemented consume if, we ended up refactoring this to this uh, call to consume if, which is clear, clearer and easier to understand if you're familiar with the abstraction. So that's another example how we use function ref in production. Okay, so how do we implement this thing? First thing is we need a template that takes a signature and that's going to be a non-implemented template. And then we specialize it to match basically the return type and the arguments. So what we do is specialize one return and args dot dot dot. Then once we specialize, we have access to those types. Now we can store our pointers. So we're going to need a void star pointer that points to any object. So you can imagine if you have a stateful lambda or something like that, it's going to point to that particular object. And then we need some sort of interface that's type array that allows us to invoke that function. In this case, we're going to use a simple function pointer that returns whatever the function ref returns and takes a void star, which is the same void star of the object, and the arguments to invoke it. So the way this is going to work is that when we call the arrays function, function pointer with our PTR and our arguments, then we're going to go through uh, our type erasure and invoke the actual object with those arguments. Yes? I, I may have missed something because I'm typing a message to you. But, uh, are you using a void star to hold? What is the void star holding? What is the Any callable. Any callable. Yes. Now, does that mean a number function? 
also, yes. I'm concerned about that. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it later. Okay. I'm concerned as well. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it work? On construction, we basically take any F function. There's going to be some uh, enable if for concepts in the real version to make sure that it matches the signature, but this is not here. And then we simply store the address of F inside our PTR void star. So we do our interpret cast, we remove the const, whatever, and then we store the address inside PTR. And then we set our raised function, which is remember the function pointer in our uh, data member over here, to a lambda that takes our PTR as a void star, takes the arguments excess, and returns whatever we return. And the body of this lambda will simply reinterpret cast our PTR to F star. F star is the original type of the function that we have access to here because we're in the constructor. And then we're going to invoke it with the arguments. So this is the trick, basically. We have access to F in our constructor because the constructor is a template. We can store this F inside the body of the race function. And then we can retrieve it later when we call the race function to access the original type of the object. That's a simple form of type erasure. Does this make sense to everybody? OK. When we invoke it, all we do is call the race function, passing our own pointer as the voice star argument, and then forwarding the arguments. So what happens is that this pointer is what we stored in the constructor over here. So it's the address of, imagine, the lambda. And then we have the address of the lambda, or arguments. We reinterpret that address as the original type of the lambda, and we invoke it with those arguments. So what we get is exactly a function call to the object we're referencing. So this is the full implementation without the extra stuff like copying, rebinding, and swapping. And it's missing some constraints, but it's fairly straightforward. And you can see that it's simple, so the compiler is able to aggressively optimize this as well. So I have a question for you. Now that you know how it works, can someone tell, tell me what happens here? Yes? Yes, so this is undefined behavior. So what, happened here, what happens here is that we have this lambda expression that creates a closure. The closure that's created is a temporary closure, so it's an R value, a PR value to be precise. And then we bind the function ref to that temporary. However, on the line where we do a CDC out, the temporary is now dead, because the lifetime of the temporary is just for the uh, full expression of the get number initialization. So when we get to the invocation of get number, then this is undefined behavior because we are accessing uh, a destroyed object. So this is the major pitfall of function ref. This code might look innocent to you, but in reality, it's just a dangling reference. It's exactly the same as taking a reference to something that's going out of scope or returning a pointer to a local from a function. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, you need to be careful, but in general, this is not a values case for function ref. Like, you wouldn't do this on purpose. It can happen if you are doing some weird stuff with it. But if you stick to the idea of taking function ref as a, as a function parameter, then it always works, unless you get it out of the function scope. One more, what about here? What? Same thing, or? No, this is not legit. There's undefined behavior as well. And this is an interesting thing. So the way the wording works right now is that we say we accept anything that's callable and take a pointer to that callable object. It turns out that in the language, pointers to functions are callable. So the pointer itself is a callable entity. So what we're doing here is actually storing a pointer to the pointer. And the pointer to the function is temporary, so the pointer goes out of scope and is going to be undefined behavior because we're accessing invalid memory. Now you might be asking, why not just you know, store the actual address of the function instead of the temporary of the pointer? So we could make that work, 
but then we have inconsistency with pointers to member functions. Because a pointer to member function is not the same size as a normal pointer, so then we will live in a world where we have a special case for free functions, we make them work by extending their lifetime, but we cannot do the same for pointers to member functions because they, they don't fit inside of a void star. So again, what we could do is instead of a void star have two pointers, but then that will make function ref bigger and people want it to be as small as possible for you know game dev purposes and stuff like that. So it is a tricky situation in my opinion. Um, we need to choose whether to be inconsistent or whether to support this use case. But again, this use case is not common as well. Like you wouldn't do this in practice. So yeah. You're the wizard, I don't know. But why is it that if you, if you can't use a member function right now, let's say, but you could use a member function if you needed it, why wouldn't you make that the special case and make the size of that thing bigger? Because it's going to be templatized on a different kind of thing, right? And this is where I'm not sure. OK. So you're saying it has, would have to be bigger all the time. It would have to be bigger all the time because, um, so the question is, can it, can it only be bigger when you're using a member, a point to a member function or a member function? Well, imagine you have this function ref with a particular signature, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it takes a foo and returns an int. Okay. okay. And that it's using a member function is not part of the interface. It's not part of the interface. That's the point, right? You want to abstract the idea of whether you're using a member function or anything else. So this, Absolutely. this. So if it's an int detail and it causes the type to change, it's great. Yes. So you cannot do that. There is no way of, you know, deciding what size it is at runtime. And if you do a compile time, then you have. A vocabulary problem. Yes, exactly. A vocabulary problem. Yeah. You could actually detect this uh, if it's a member function or if it's uh, just a bobo function and just correctly initialize Yes. It's, it's the observation is you could detect this. You could check if it's a member function or not free function, correctly initialize the pointer. Yeah, it's quite easy to do as well. The main concern is, one is inconsistency, and then why we want to support this use case. Like, it doesn't seem like a useful use case. So we need, if you really strongly want this, please speak up and tell us why we want to do this. Like, what's your use case? Because it asks, we need to justify the extra complexity. Okay, I agree with that, but then what happens is that someone figures out, oh, look, it extends the lifetime of free functions, so it will work with my lambdas, it will work with my pointer to member functions. So the point is, if someone learns that this extends the lifetime of a particular set of functions, they might expect it to work with others. And if we make it really clear from the beginning that this thing is just a reference, so you need to be careful with anything, then it might be easier to teach rather than teaching the special case. You know, we could argue about this. I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, I don't really mind one way or the other. I just don't see the, the benefit of this. It's just to prevent misuse of it, but then if you're misusing it already, I don't think we should support that. Yeah. So complexity, are you trading off implementation complexity or interface complexity? Is there some cost to the user? If you make this work, if you work really hard and make it work, is it, could you in effect then have this better implementation and then just tell the user, but it's undefined and then later say, just kidding, it is defined? In other words, is there a cost to the user, or is it just for the implement? So let, let me, OK, I get your question. Let me clarify for everyone. So this wouldn't require any extra runtime cost in general. It would be an extra cost to check at compile time whether the thing is a free function or not. And if we want to support this use case, we cannot simply make it an implementation detail, because we need to make it obvious in the wording that for free functions, if you pass a pointer to a free function, we're actually going to strip the pointer for you. So there has to be something in the interface, in the wording, that makes this work. It cannot be an implementation detail. OK, okay. but the bottom line is, adding this functionality later is A, backwards compatible, because you couldn't do it before now. Yes. And B, has no overhead for clients. It's just for implementers like you. And no one cares about it. I know, I know. <laughs> Still, I, I have concerns that I mentioned to him, which if we make this work, people are going to use it, which I don't think is a good use of function ref. So we're supporting a bad use case. I don't see why we would want to do that. Oh like, like my, as you mentioned, it's backward compatible. So my conservative idea would be, let's just roll it out like this. And if people figure out a very a killer use case for this particular feature, we can just add it in later. And wait six years. Yes, and wait six years. 
a Bloomberg is 10 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yes, but that would break the main use case for function ref, which is using it as a function argument. Because if you want to pass a lambda to a function. Exactly, it's the same problem with Stringview. Yes, so the only way we can make this work if we have something in Rust, like Rust, like lifetimes, which are proposals for it, but that's another kind of worms. And then I think the idea is that once we have that in C++, you would have to annotate the implementation of function ref and say, okay, the lifetime of this thing is gonna be held by this pointer, and the compiler could give you an error of that, but that's a long time away, I think. Okay, so now something positive, the benchmarks. Mm -hmm. I use this website, it's very cool, it's called, whoops, quick bench, and basically it's like Godbolt, like one box, you just provide the code on one side and then it benchmarks you, it for you and it gives you a very nice graph and stuff like that. It uses Simon Brand's function of implementation. He's at the conference, I don't know if he's in this room, but he wrote this compliant implementation that you can use today. And internally, the quickbench.com system uses Google benchmarks, so it's quite familiar if you've used that before. The scenario is very simple, it's you have a loop and you invoke a simple high order function inside the loop body and I tested it with template parameters, function ref, and a CD function with and without inlining. So I want to see how much inlining makes a difference and what's the uh, performance overhead of this abstraction compared to each other. So in this case, we have you know, three simple high order functions. They take one, an F by template, one by a CD function, one by function ref. And in this case, TL is the <laughs> Simon's brand is time space, but it is a compliant implementation of function ref. And then we use this benchmark on column do not optimize to prevent the compiler from optimizing away a call that has no side effects. So this is something from Google benchmark that creates like an optimization barrier. And since we use it in every single test, it's fair to do that. I also have the same versions with no inline. So this is just to see what's the overhead of these things if I don't have inlining. So you, this simulates the use case where you basically are uh, trespassing translation, translation unit boundaries. And then my test is really simple. I have this benchmark that simply iterates over the state. This state is a Google benchmark thing that basically uh, allows you to do multiple tests. And then it's gonna iterate over this thing until it has enough information to get a valid statistical um, analysis of the performance of this thing. So it's gonna deal with the iterator, iteration count on its own and just do the right thing. And I have one for template parameter, one for function ref, and so on. So let's see what happens. This is the first benchmark. It's using GCC 8.x. It's using O3 and libs standard C++. And you can see that inline template parameter and inline function ref are exactly the same. So if you use function ref and you are in the same TU, then it's going to be equivalent performance as a template parameter, but without all the drawbacks of a template parameter. If you lose inlining, then you can see that the template gets 3.x slower than an inlined one, and then we have a CD function with inlining that's seven times slower than function ref. So if you have inlining enabled, function is gonna be seven times as slow as function ref, only to invoke it, not even the creation, just to invoke it. If you have a not inline function ref, then it's gonna be eight times as slow as template parameter. If you have a non inline CD function, it's gonna be 11 times as slow as a template parameter. These results are quite consistent between other compilers, so Clang as well has the same hierarchy, so it's gonna be template parameter function ref on the same level with inlining, and then we're gonna have a um, CD function around eight times lower than those. <coughs> Libc++ changes the things a little bit, but not the hierarchy. A CD function in Libc++ seems to be a little bit faster, so it's just, just seven times as slow, but again, the template parameter and function ref just destroy everything else if inlining is enabled. And in general, always without inlining, function ref is still faster than a CD function, even though it's not great. So my conclusions are, when you have inlining, then function ref is always as fast as a template parameter, so you don't pay any cost for that. It's very good. And when you have inlining, a CD function is at least seven times as low as function ref. So that's the price you pay when you use a CD function, just for invocation. There might be extra costs related to initialization of a CD function as well. 
When inlining doesn't happen, then function ref is around two times lower than a template parameter, and an SED function is around 1.x lower than function ref. So when you don't have inlining, the difference is not as big, but it's still present. In general, SED function, sorry, in general, function ref is optimizer friendly and thrives with inlining, and function ref is always faster than a CD function, independently of whether you have inlining enabled or not. So yeah, that's pretty much the end. As a recap in general, any function accepting or returning an order is a high order function. You have many examples in both the CNC plus standard, but as John said, these are very wide description, and you might want to uh, dive down into the patterns. Yeah, I have a question over there. I did not try O2. We can try that uh, later if you want. I I wouldn't expect a significant difference. The hierarchy will still be the same in in my assumption. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, so I'm sold on the function ref on performance side, but uh, I don't like the story of the uh, it's too easy to make mistakes in terms of uh, lifetime. So if, let's say I have a container uh, with all my commands. Like uh, regular uh, sub functions, and I want the, the invocation or the processing to happen through uh, function ref. Uh, do you envision providing something similar to uh, the connection between um, sharp PTR and weak PTR in terms of uh, me being able to obtain a function ref for, from an SPD function with a function like lock or just in the ref, uh, so that I, I have the guarantee I can check for null? before invoking the, the function ref to make sure it's similar. Okay, so the question is, long I'll try to paraphrase it, if you have a vector OSD function and you want to access those functions through function ref, you have lifetime issues if you're not careful. So what you would want is something like a share pointer, weak pointer relationship where you can check from the weak pointer if the thing is actually alive. So I think that first of all, this is not a use case for function ref. I don't think that like function ref is a very lightweight reference, so if you actually want to check whether the thing is alive before calling it, then already you are outside the realm of function ref. There is a good talk by Louis Dion, which is about Dino, a library he made, and basically what you can do is define type race things, and he shows how you can write unique function, shared function, and function ref all at once by using his library. And the idea is that, you know, we use SED functions of vocabulary type, but being a vocabulary type is very, um, makes it very flexible, but also doesn't cover any specialized use case. So if we add something more specialized, like unique function, share function, then I find it very um, likely that we also have a weak function in conjunction with the share function. So maybe that's what you want. You don't really want a function ref. Um, I think the function ref in general, the use case is, I know exactly the last time of this thing, I want to use it as a function parameter 99% of the times, and the remaining 1% are cases where you are sure that it's gonna, not gonna outlive it. If you have uncertainty, uncertainty, then you need a different abstraction like sure function plus weak, uh, weak function. Yeah. There are absolutely use cases for raw pointers. We don't want to get rid of them. We want to use them appropriately. And so this is a, this is a power tool. Like any other power tool, C++ is not for you know, the uninitiated. And it comes with a warning and a label. And if you don't feel it's safe, then don't use it. Yeah. If you feel it's safe, then use it. I agree, I agree. And it's it's basically stream view all over again. You know, stream view has a lot of performance benefits. It's really safe to use it as a function parameter, but people still make mistakes. And I think it's up to the user to understand what the what this type represents, how to use it properly. And unfortunately it would be really nice if we had compiler support to tell us when we're making a mistake. But since we're not Rust yet then we need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, how can you explain that a uh, function is seven times slower when the only difference is that it's only versus not only? Okay. Occasional, how can it be so slow? Okay, so the... Whoa, I mean, size two. I mean, size matters. Like the size yeah. of the function, the, the, whatever is part of the... If you have a lot of functions, for example, then you take up a uh, cash, you know, that's on state and so on. And that's much more important than virtual function calls, to be fair. The virtual function calls can be not in functions case, but in some cases. Yeah, in this case, it doesn't, shouldn't matter because it's always the same function being invoked over and over. So it should always be in cache. So the question is, why is function seven times slower if it's just difference between owning and unowning? I, so first of all, this may change with how the compilers evolve. 
maybe they figure out some cool optimization that makes it work better in the future. I haven't explored this in depth. My assumption is that there is complexity in the implementation because of this mob after optimization. You know, it's going to be 64 bytes to allow something to be emplaced inside the buffer. And then it's going to have to branch. And then it has the indirection. It might dynamically locate. So there is, like, the implementation is not as straightforward as function ref. So it might just be a case of the compiler not being able to figure it out, not, uh, you know, exceeding the inlining depth or something like that. That might be a valid explanation, but I'm happy to research this further. Yeah. I can help explain this. Uh, I have some experience in production where it doesn't inline, and if it crashes uh, in the call, you can see there's about seven layers of indirection. So it's yeah. an implementation problem. So you have seven function calls which don't get in line. Okay. So this is an implementation problem. Okay. So the claim is that this is a quality of implementation issue because crashes in production show that a CD function from invocation to the call side has at least seven layers of, you know, intermediate, intermediate functions for implementation reasons. And that might be defeating the inliner. So that's one possible explanation, yeah. And because it takes, currently the implementation takes advantage of type erasure, and type erasure is all about hiding that, uh, that virtual function call. So unless it can de virtualize it right there, then you do have that. That is true. Uh, there are patterns where that can be virtualized, and I don't know if that's one of them. But definitely, if you're doing vertical <coughs> coding, where you're using the space as a buffer, that slows things down dramatically. And many uh, short string optimizations don't take full advantage of the footprint. They actually leave some things outside to improve performance. OK, yeah. So the observation is that type erasure as a technique Im implies indirection and implies that you know the compiler doesn't always have full knowledge of what's being done. And this, you said small string optimization? Yes, it, it is slower to vertically, to use all the space in the short string is slower than to not use it and to have some of the data outside. And for that reason, uh, uh, mm, okay. you're, you're going to do things sometimes to make things faster by making them bigger. Again, function, how it's optimized and what it does, it might be faster, for example, to, do, to implement function to be bigger in the case that you're talking about so that it can be faster, not do all the vertical decoding. Yeah, OK. So to paraphrase that, small buffer optimization has benefits and drawbacks. And it depends on basically how it's going to be used. Sometimes if you have a indirection and you know proper allocation and stuff like that, then it might actually be faster to have the indirection. Uh, I'm going to take questions later. I have out of time. So in general, what I wanted to show with this talk is very use case of higher order function, how lambda expressions make them easy to use and compare to them to some alternatives. Uh, in general, don't go fully functional to benefit from these things. You can introduce them gradually in an existing code base. And also, uh, you know, consider uh, thinking about use cases for function ref following the uh, standardization procedure. And if you have you know, concerns or feedback, please give them to me and you can participate into that. You can start using function ref today if you use an implementation like Tartan Lamas, which is Simon Brand, or you can roll out your own. We did, I did this at Bloomberg. We have our own implementation and it's, you know, quite easy to implement if you know uh, some library development skills. And thank you. That's it.